sure. Okay, Rabbi Kelman, I think it's 11 o'clock there yeah. in Toronto. So I just want to, because uh, it's been a while since I've been able to attend, um, and I'm glad I'm here at least for the beginning. So I really want to thank, you know, Dr. Lakshan for part 10 now of a 10-part series, and he's been teaching before this, and please God, he'll be continuing after Pesach. So it's really... Uh, an honor and a pleasure and I want to thank you for all the uh, hard work and the efforts you put in and I know uh, many people appreciate it and uh, okay you should continue for, for many years to be Marbit Torah, Teach Torah in all its facets uh, now across the world sitting from from your home in Yerushalayim to the four corners of the world okay vakasha it's really a wonderful feeling and you know I think we all owe a vote of uh, thanks to uh, Rabbi Kelman for putting together uh, programs like he puts together and allowing people from uh, so many different time zones to get together and uh, and, and study Torah. Jack so, this, Jack, Rabbi yes. so this is the last uh, session of Parsha News and Polemics. And for those of you who were here last week, we saw some slightly unpleasant texts last week, some texts, uh, so, some strongly worded texts uh, where we saw the Jews were saying some pretty nasty things about Christianity. And we discussed the question about whether they were actually saying these things to Christians. Uh, of course, we all know that Christians were saying many, many nasty things and worse things about Judaism. And the Jews were the underdogs. And underdogs sometimes, one of the ways that the underdogs uh, deal with the fact that they are the underdogs is through uh, satire. Uh, and, and we discussed the, the extent to which People ever said some of those things that we read uh, re read last week, and I, I, I told you that my teacher, Professor David Berger, says that uh, the the assumption that all of these things were just written and were never said seems to him a little uh, a little overstated, and that there there is some evidence that actually some of these nasty things were said in various uh, in, in in various circumstances. But I didn't want to finish with that, and that's why the last session is going to be something totally different. And it's going to be exploring the question of, were there any cooperative ways in which Jews and Christians approached the Bible in medieval times? And that's the, that's the theme for today's session. Okay, so we will start at the end of medieval times. I'll share my screen here. Um, we'll start here with Don Isaac Barbanel. 1437 to 1508, I'm sure that all of you know something about Barbanel. He, uh, he, he was an important person in Spain and in Portugal and involved in the government uh, of, those, uh, of those countries. He was a respected uh, uh, member of the, uh, of the government there and he was a, an extremely learned Jew. And when the Jews were <clears throat> expelled from Spain and from Portugal at the end of the 15th century. Uh, he, he says that he, he was given the opportunity that he did not have to leave, but he decided that if the Jewish community was leaving, then certainly he too was going to leave. And because he's at the end of medieval times, he's, he's kind of one of these transitional figures in some sense, in some senses, he's a uh, he's a medieval person, and in some senses, he's a modern person. And he has an extremely wide education outside of uh, outside of Jewish sources. And so, the first text that I have here uh, is from his commentary on Isaiah. And this is a com th th this comment here could have been written by many, many Jews over the years. There's nothing particularly different or modern or almost modern about this commentary of Abarbanel. He writes here uh, about the verse that, uh, that says, God will give a sign. The Alma is with child and is about to give birth to a son and let her name him Emmanuel. He, he writes, I'll read it in uh, English. The Christians, however, say on the basis of their apostle Matthew, 
the, the verses, God will give a sign, the Alma is with child and is about to give birth to a son, let her name him Emmanuel, was written about Mary, who conceived as a virgin and gave birth to their God, Jesus. And that is why he was called Emmanuel, Emmanuel meaning Emmanuel. Um, some of you might know I have a, uh, a grandson named Emmanuel and before my daughter named uh, her son Emmanuel, she phoned me up and she said, Abba, is it okay for Jews to, uh, to, to, to use the name Emmanuel? Uh, and I said, look, there, uh, let me name for you the, uh, the, the, the wonderful people named Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, Emmanuel Shochet, uh, in, uh, in, in Toronto. You know, it's, it's a fine, uh, fine Jewish name, but it also became an important name for the Christians. So, so uh, here we have, uh, 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 we have uh, a Barbanel telling us the Christian claim, and then he writes, There are seven strong arguments against this interpretation. And then he goes through with seven reasons why this is not a reasonable interpretation of the text. The only thing that's a little different about this text from texts that, that, that other uh, commentators wrote uh, before him in their commentaries, uh, other Jewish commentators wrote in their commentary to, uh, to Isaiah, before him is that he's actually identifying where the claim comes from, from the Apostle Matthew, and, uh, and he knows uh, what it is that they're saying. And he's saying openly, this is what they say. And here are the seven reasons why this is a poor interpretation of the text. I'm sure that uh, all of you know that the word Alma doesn't necessarily mean virgin. And, uh, you know, the very idea that uh, that, that Isaiah would be giving a, a sign that, you know, there was, there was some doubt in the scene there in Isaiah chapter seven, and he gives a sign and says, well, here is the sign, and that the sign would be something that would be happening 700 years later. Uh, it, it, it does not make, uh, make an awful lot of sense. And the, the simplest understanding, actually, of the phrase, ineha alma hara, it means that, that there was some alma, there was some uh, young woman there in the room, and he pointed to uh, this young woman and he said, look, here is a woman with child. She's about to give uh, birth to a son. And before that son grows up, then the uh, military concern that you have will, uh, will, will, will disappear. So, so th that's a, they're very strong arguments. And a Barbanel here is in the tradition of the Jewish commentators uh, uh, presenting standard Jewish arguments, strong standard Jewish arguments against the Christian reading of Isaiah chapter seven. Uh, then we find that a Barbanel is quoting Christians pretty, uh, pretty frequently. I, I, you know, I did a, a, a fast uh, search uh, in the using the software of, uh, of Bar Ilan University, I looked for the word no stream in uh, Barbanel's commentaries and came up with 280 examples of him uh, referring to the no stream. And so here he is in his commentary on, uh, on First Kings says, maybe this is the reason why Jerome, one of the Christian scholars wrote, you know, so, so he's, he, he knows what, uh, what Jerome said about the Bible. And in his commentary on Kings, as he presents some arguments and said, okay, that could explain why Jerome interpreted in this, uh, in this way. And then we find other places like this commentary, the second text here on this uh, slide is from, uh, from the first book of, Sa uh, of Samuel, uh, where he says, this is the opinion of Rav Sadia Gaon and Rav Hai Gaon. And some of the Christian scholars were also attracted to it. You know, he didn't have to do this. He didn't have to say, you know, he could have just said, you know, he's, he's going through interpretations of that passage in Shmuel Aleph. And he says, okay, here's an interpretation that's offered by Sadia Gon and Rabbi Gaon. But he says, you know, some of the Christians also uh, liked that interpretation. So this, still, you know, here in the first slide, we were dealing with a uh, you know kind of negative attitude towards the Christian interpretation. In the second slide, we're dealing with a kind of neutral parva attitude. It's just that he's mentioning it for no particular uh, particular reason. Uh, another example like this: 
uh, in his uh, his commentary also on, uh, on the book of Samuel about why, uh, concerning this issue, why was God angry and why was Samuel perturbed when the people asked for a king, considering that appointing a king is one of the mitzvot of the Torah? Really good question. Uh, Chazal say that, that, you know, the Torah says, Tom tasim alecha melech, melech. Uh, and, and Chazal say that that's one of the 613 uh, mitzvot. So why were they uh, angry or perturbed about? Uh, I found five different approaches in Chazal and in the recent and older Christian commentator. So again, he's, uh, you know, uh, I hope they'll forgive me for saying this. He kind of sounds a little bit like a professor in the university who's, you know, just like collecting all the sources that he has on the subject. And, you know, he's not just a Jew surveying what Jews have said beforehand. He said, uh, here's, here's the five approaches that I found in Chazal and in, the, uh, in my study of the history of Christian commentators. Uh, and then we find that from time to time, he actually gives compliments to the Christians. In his commentary here on Isaiah chapter 21, he says, the Christian commentators say that Babylonia is called Nibar Yam, since the Euphrates, a river as big as the sea, flows through it. Venachon, who, this is correct. You know, he didn't find a Jewish source that says this. So the, the, the phrase Midbar Yam appears in Isaiah chapter 21. And he says, this is a reference to the Euphrates River. And uh, the, the, I'm sorry, it's a reference to Babylonia. And I learned this from the Christian commentator saying he doesn't have a Jewish uh, source for this, but then it doesn't bother him to say that that's what he learned from the Christians. Another example. Uh, the verse in Shmuel Aleph, Ulachana Natan Mana Achat Apaim. The opening chapter of Shmuel Aleph talks about Elkanah, who had two wives, his wife uh, Pnina, who had a number of children, and his wife Chana, uh, who only had one child. And it said that when they would go up to the uh, to the shrine and they would partake of the sacrifice, then he would give out, he, he gave to Pnina enough portions for her and for all of her children. But Hana received mana achat apayim. It's a very difficult word there. What does apayim mean in that context? And so he writes, Ufershuha mefarshim apayim mana achat nichbedet. So the commentators explained, one substantial portion. The, the, since since Hana was alone, she didn't have any children. She only got one portion of the sacrifice, but she received a substantial portion. And then he quotes uh, what it says in the Targum uh, Yonatan. According to Yonatan, it means, and then he explains uh, Yonatan's explanation. And then he said, both of these are based on Chazal. You can find both of these explanations of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the word apayim in the uh, Talmudic uh, era rabbis. And then he quotes other, uh, other interpretations that are kind of post-Talmudic. Gersonides explained Rabbi Levi ben Gershon Perirash, and then he gave uh, that interpretation. And then he writes, the Christians translated Tristus in Latin. And for those of you Latin scholars, those of you my age from Canada or from other places who were forced to learn uh, uh, Latin, you can see it in the uh, bottom left-hand corner here, what it says in the Vulgate and the official Christian translation of the Bible into uh, into Latin, Ani autem dedit partem unem tristis. Ani, the dative of Anna, of Chana. To Chana, however, he gave dedit partem unem, uh, one part, one portion, tristis. Tristis means sadly. Um, those of you who have studied a little bit of French know that the triste is the word for, uh, for sad in French comes from the Latin Tristus. So he says here, going back to the right-hand side of the slide here, the Christians translated Tristus in Latin, meaning that because Elkanah gave Hannah only one portion, he found this upsetting. This bothered him. He felt bad about the fact that Hannah did not have any children. He was upset about this 
when he was divvying out the portions, he knew that Hannah only got one portion because she didn't have any children, but he was very sad. He was upset about this. And then he goes on and says, Rabbi David Kimchi also offered this explanation in his father's name. And then he writes, Vehu perush yafem od. This is a very nice interpretation of the text. You know, high compliments. And notice here, if he weren't so intellectually honest, he could have just said, the commentators say this, Yonatan says this, Gersonides says this, and David Kimchi, in the name of his father, Yosef Kimchi, says this. And I like the interpretation of David Kimchi. But he knows that David Kimchi wasn't the first person to offer this interpretation. And it's even possible that David or Joseph Kimchi, living there in the south of France, uh, were acquainted with the, uh, with the Vulgate uh, translation here. And so he knows that they might not, have, that they too could have been influenced by the Christians. They didn't write, Kimchi never writes. I'm, uh, I'm writing this interpretation because that's uh, what, uh, what I learned from the Christians, but here, a Barbanella say, so here's what the Christians said, and you know, who perush yafem ot, giving out compliments to the uh, to the Christian in, in, interpreters. Um, and another example from the beginning of uh, uh, from First Kings chapter eight, he lists uh, many uh, explanations of the text, and then he says, "V'omnam chachme anotzrim nimshachu b'zeh achar dat ha'achronim mechachme aminu." The Christian scholars follow the opinion of more recent scholars of our people. And then he writes, Uvehemet, Roe Anir Tivrehem Baze Yoter Mikashvim, Mikol Divre Sha'ara Chachamim Asher Zacharti, Mibne Amenu. I really prefer their approach on this issue to all the explanations that I mentioned beforehand by members of our people. So he goes through like this history of the Jewish interpretation of this passage. And then he says, You know, what I find in the Christian is, in the Christian works, is kind of like, the more recent Jewish scholars, and I really think that they got it right, that the Christians got it right in this uh, in, in, in this uh, text. So, the, so a, uh, a, a surprising amount of intellectual honesty of saying that, uh, that, that he's learning from things that the Christians have written. So the question is, how common was this? As I said, Abarbanel is at the uh, the cusp, at the border here. He's at, at the time when uh, medieval times are finishing, modern times are beginning. There's uh, there are many modern uh, aspects to uh, to Abarbanel, and uh, is that what explains why he is willing to offer these kinds of uh, of interpretations? Perhaps. Um, I should give uh, credit where credit is due. The next text that I will be doing, I've learned from the uh, from uh, the writings of Professor Frank Talmadge as the Chronaldi Bracha of the University of Toronto. I know that there are a number of uh, Torontonians uh, on this uh, uh, at this year, and some of you, uh, some of you. Uh, knew uh, Professor Talmadge, who was a great uh, scholar. So Professor Talmadge found in this somewhat obscure work, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Aknin's commentary on the Song of Songs, written in the 12th or early 13th uh, century, the introduction to this uh, work. He writes as follows. He said, just, uh, I'm sure you all know that in introductions to works, particularly in medieval times and in introductions to works, people sometimes went off on, on uh, very long uh, tangents. And he's telling a story about Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid, who lived uh, quite a few years before him. Uh, the Zachar Rav Shmuel Hanagid Zal Gamken Bech Kitab Al Astagna. The Sefer Ha'in Bar, Asher Bo Hirbal Lahabi Me Perushe Hanotzrim. We don't have this work of Rav Shmuel Hanagid, but he says here that in the work called uh, Sefer Ha'in Bar, written by Shmuel Hanagid, 
he often quotes the interpretations of Christian scholars. And he wrote there, it's kind of an explanation of this, Ki Rabbi Matzliach ben Albatzik Dayan bet Cecilia beshuvo mi Baghdad shalach lo lahanagid igeret besipur chaye Rabbeinu hai gaon. This is, you know, this is almost like broken telephone. There's a story going on here. This guy is quoting, this guy is quoting, this guy, and he's quoting Rabbi Matzliach, the Dayan of Cecilia. I haven't been able to find out precisely who is Rabbi Matzliach, the Dayan of Cecilia. But anyways, this, uh, this Dayan in Cecilia took a trip to Baghdad. And when he got back from Baghdad, he wrote a letter to Shmuel Hanagid in which he told the story of the great, uh, the great scholar, Rav Hai Gaon. And he's going to tell now a story that once happened in the yeshiva of Rav Hai Gaon. So here's the, the background, and here's the story. Among other things, he reported, one day a discussion took place in the yeshiva about the meaning of the verse in the book of Psalms, Shemen Rosh Al Yani Roshi, a very difficult verse. Shemen Rosh Al Yani Roshi. So I gave you here the JPS uh, translation here. Let my head not refuse such choice oil. Uh, perhaps that's what it means. Uh, I think the JPS, as it often does, marks this verse with the notation, meaning of Hebrew uncertain. And just as the JPS is uncertain, so also in Rav Haiga owns yeshiva, they were uncertain about how to understand this verse in Tehillim. The, the, the assembled in the yeshiva disagreed about its meaning. They, a, a, a fight broke out in the yeshiva, a disagreement broke out in the yeshiva about how to interpret this uh, verse. Rav Haigaon suggested to Rav Matzliach that he go to the Catholicus and ask him what he has in writings, in translations, orally. It's not clear, just looking at the Hebrew here. The Ramaz Rav Haizal la Rav Matzliach sheyelech el hakatolikus. The Katolikus is a title that was used for uh, for Christian uh, archbishops, uh, leaders of the church in various countries in Armenia and in, in various uh, other uh, uh, other Eastern countries. They they use this term Katolikus, where the Catholics might be using the term like uh, like archbishop. So Rav Hai uh, suggested to Rav Matzliach that he should go to the Catholicus. He suggested, you know, we can't figure out what this means. Let's go ask the Catholicus. Uh, what, what, what does he have in the interpretation of this verse? And the story goes on. And Rabbi Matzliach was displeased. He didn't like the idea that the head of the yeshiva, that Rav Haigaon was telling him to go over to the Catholicus and ask him a question about uh, the interpretation of a verse in Tehillim. When Rav Hai saw that Rav Matzliach was displeased, Rav Hai chastised him, saying, our forefathers and the righteous people of previous generations, very holy people, never hesitated to ask the members of other faiths about the meaning of words in the Bible. As we all well know, this is, this is something we all know, that Jews did not uh, refrain from doing things like this. The halach rabbi matzliach zal el Misha'al et Piv. So Rav Matzliach went to the Catholicus and asked them what the interpretation do you guys here in the uh, Christian yeshiva here in the Christian uh, uh, monastery or whatever, you, you got anything to say about that verse in, uh, in, in Tehillim? And 
Although uh, Rav Hai is quoted here as saying that uh, never hesitated to ask members of other faiths, as we all know, when Professor Talmadge wrote up this uh, text, he said that he has not found another medieval text that actually says the same thing. Here's just a grand total of one medieval text that suggests that this was something common that was going on, that Jews and Christians were um, consulting, the Jews would consult with Christians about the interpretation of a biblical verse. Okay, so I'm going a little bit uh, backwards historically here in today's class. I began with a Barbanel because a Barbanel is uh, like the kind of clearest example of one of our uh, traditional Jewish Bible commentators who uh, is willing to quote what the Christians say. And now we came to Rav Yosef Ibn Akhtin, who's not, uh, not all that well known in the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century. And I, I will continue traveling backwards and I will be finishing off uh, our, our, our session here with, uh, as some of you know, my favorite uh, Bible commentator, Rashbam. Um, Rashbam, Rashi's grandson, uh, we saw earlier, we actually had two sessions about Rashbam earlier in this, uh, in, in this series of lectures where we saw various comments that he made that he said are minim in order to refute the claims of the uh, of the Christians. We we looked through those uh, texts pretty carefully uh, in sessions number four and five or three and four, I forget now. Uh, and we did notice that he knows something about what the Christians say, but not a lot about what the Christians say. And while he admits that he's offering various interpretations to refute what the Christians say, uh, he does it without any venom. Uh, 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 very different from what we saw afterwards in later, uh, in, in later commentaries. Now, I can't find, I'm, I'm not going to suggest to you that I can find any place where, uh, where Rashbam actually openly talks about collaboration with Christians. However, you know, it looks to me like there is some evidence for it. And I'd like to share a little bit of the evidence that exists for the fact that Rashbam seems to have been talking to Christians. Start at a very uh, strange uh, place here, Rashbam's commentary on uh, tsara'at, uh, often translated as leprosy, uh, probably some other skin disease, Rashbam's uh, commentary on tsara'at in the book of Ayikra Leviticus. He writes, when we follow the plain meaning of scripture or the expertise gained through the ways of the human world, we have nothing to add concerning all these sections that describe plagues of humans or of clothing or of houses, you know, you know I, I, I've been trying to bring my knowledge of the world into my commentary on the Torah, says Rosh Prami often says, here's an interpretation that I'm offering, Lafi derech eretz, but uh, here he says, Bekiyut derech eretz shel b'nei adam, knowing how the world works does not help you understand these texts about Sarah. They, they, uh, they don't become any clearer to you from studying about the world. Uh, the, wor the world around us. And he says, you know, this is referring to tzarat that people have or tzarat in clothing or tzarat in houses. All of these things are found uh, in the uh, portions Tazriya Matsora in, uh, in Vayikra. The way they look, the way to count their quarantine periods or the distinctions between white, black, and yellow hairs. You know, I'm writing a shot commentary on the Torah, and I like, I have nothing to say about the subject. Rather, the truth is found through the exegesis, the midrash of the rabbis, their laws, and the traditions that they received from the earlier rabbis. I, I don't have anything to say about this. And so I'm just going to, you know, send you to what the rabbis said about Sarat, because I don't have anything to add. A, a pious, uh, bias statement here from, uh, from Rushbaum. Go on a moment to the next slide and we see Andrew of St. Victor, 
who's just a few years younger than Rashbam. We don't know when he was born, but he died in 1175. The St. Victor Monastery was, uh, was and is on the outskirts of, uh, of Paris. And uh, there's a, a recent book that has come out about the writings of Andrew of St. Victor and Hugh of St. Victor. I uh, hold up the book here, a, a, a scholar of Christian, uh, of Christian Bible commentaries named Monse Lera Korea, who spent 10 years here living in Jerusalem, studying Hebrew, uh, studying modern Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, and, uh, and rabbinic Hebrew, and, uh, and wrote a book about the Victorines, that's Andrew of St. Victor and his older contemporary Hugh of St. Victor, who are always quoting the Jews in their commentary. We'll see some examples of quoting, but we'll begin here, not with an example of quoting, but of Andrew saying something that sounds, you know, just like what Rashbaum said in the previous slide. He says here, when there is leprosy in a wool or a linen garment, he says, leprosy in clothes, or in houses or such things concerning which the law speaks, we haven't seen in our time or in our place. It is not easy to determine which blemishes are or are not leprous. So, you know, Rashbam says, like, I got nothing to say about this stuff. And Andrew of St. Victor, Rashbam lived uh, in Northern France, and in his works, he, he talks about visits that he took to Paris. He didn't live in Paris, but he took, uh, he took visits to Paris. And both he and Andrew are writing the same thing. You know, we don't know what to do with these uh, texts about Sarat. Uh, and then we find Andrew of St. Victor saying things like this uh, about the verse, Zot mishchat aharon u mishchat banav me'ishe Hashem you know, literally, this means this is the anointing, Mishcha from Limshoch to anoint. This is the anointing of Aharon and the anointing of his sons. Uh, but Rashbam writes in his commentary here, Zot Mishchat Aharon Mishchat Banav. He writes, Schar Mishchat Aharon Uvanav. This is the uh, reward that. Aharon received for agreeing to become anointed. Because the, the text there is not talking about the anointing itself, it's talking about various privileges that Aaron and his sons get. And so Rashbam says, well, this doesn't mean Mishchat Aharon, it means that, it, 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 what it means is the, the reward that he got for, uh, for agreeing to be anointed. And then if you, for those of you who can read a little bit of Latin, that's not very difficult Latin and they, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, Andrew quotes the Vulgate, which says, haec est unctio aharon. This is the anointing of Aaron. And then he writes, in Hebreo est augmentum, but the Hebrew actually doesn't say anointing. The Hebrew says increase, like to augment the English word coming from augmentum. Andrew of St. Victor knew a little bit of Hebrew, but not very much Hebrew. I used to tell my students that I thought that Andrew of St. Victor's Hebrew was probably about as good as my Latin, uh, that, you know, that uh, I, I, I I can use it a little bit, but uh, uh, I need help when I get to a difficult uh, passage. And I look at something like this and I say, Andrew is having trouble, you know, what, what does it mean here? This is the unctio, this is the, uh, the, the, this is the anointing of Aaron when the text isn't about anointing. And then he said, uh, yes, a Jew, what does this mean? And the Jew says, oh, it means reward, increase, augment. And then he says, oh, okay, now I know that that's what the Hebrew means, that there's a mistake here in the Vulgate, that even though this is our official text uh, the, for the Catholic Church, haec est unctio Aaron, uh, you know, I've asked the Jews, and Andrew of St. Victor's uh, comment, uh, commentary, and uh, the commentary of his older contemporary, Hugh of St. Victor, is filled with quotations from the Jews, 
the Eudaios, he's quoting the Jews and he's making statements about the Hebrew. And uh, this, uh, this scholar, uh, uh, Monse Lera Korea, went through, gathered together the hundreds of passages where Andrew of St. Victor and Hugh of St. Victor quote what the Jews say. And she counted up how many of them agree with Rashi and how many of them agree with Ibn Ezra and how many of them agree with Rashbam. And she came to the conclusion that Andrew and Hugh must have known Rashbam, or if they didn't know Rashbam, they knew a student of Rashbam. And they're constantly quoting uh, the, what the Jews say, and it, it never, never in a polemical uh, way. It, it, there are works, there, there is a work that Andrew of St. Victor wrote that was a kind of a religious uh, work. I've never, uh, I've never read it, but I'm told that there are some uh, nasty comments about Jews and Judaism in that work. But in his exegetical work, in his commentary, he's quoting the Hebrews as, as experts in the text, even here where, you know, Rashbam or somebody or some student of Rashbam or somebody else there in Northern France is telling him that that's what the Hebrew means. When we know that actually that isn't what the Hebrew means, the word Mishra, uh, you know, in this context, Rashbam says it should be understood that way. But Andrew is portraying it here as a kind of a correction of the Vulgate. I now know that the Vulgate is inaccurate here because the Jews have told me that, uh, that, that this thing really means, uh, means augmento. Andrew writing about the verse Arami Oved Avi uh, that we all the recent translations all uh, all uh, translate as my father was a wandering Aramean he uh, he just writes here uh, Arami which uh, appears as Cirrus in the Latin uh, a Syrian in in the Latin of the Vulgate and uh, he writes Laban. Ut ayunt. This is a reference to Levin, as they say. Who's the who's the they there? The ayunt, the, uh, the 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 they who are saying it's the Jews. The Jews are telling him that this is a verse about Laban because that's what they taught us. Because that's what Rashi says. So that's what the Haggadah says. And so that's uh, 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 Andrew says that that is the meaning of the passage. Okay. So I think. I've only given you a few examples. There's a whole book here of Monsi uh, 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 Lera Curia trying to, to prove that, uh, that Andrew and Hugh were learning from the rabbis. I'm convinced uh, that that is the case and that they were either learning directly from Rashbam or they were learning from, um, from a student of Rashbam. I'm, I think she made an extremely strong case for this. There is no evidence, though, that I can pull out of my hat of saying that Rashbam uh, actually learned from these discussions with the Christians, uh, or that Rashbam was influenced by having spent time discussing biblical texts with Christians. Although I will finish off now with one somewhat long text from Rashbam. It'll, it'll take us to the end of the, uh, of the session here in which I, I wouldn't want to say that I'm convinced that he was influenced by the Christians, but you see some little similarity between what he's doing with the text and what the Christians are doing with the text. Okay. We move now to the text, the difficult text in the beginning of Parshat Vayera in Genesis chapter 18, which begins by telling the story that uh, Avraham is in uh, Elone Mamre, and it says that yud heh vav -Heh appeared to him. He was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the day grew hot. That's what verse 1 says in chapter 18. And then verse 2 says, looking up, he saw three men standing near him, as soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them, and bowing to the ground, he said, my lords, if it please you, do not go on past your servant, let a little water be brought, bathe your feet, and recline under the tree. Okay, so verse one says that yud heh vav -Heh appears to Abraham, and then in verse two, it says the three people were there. Now there are 
two different ways, traditional ways of understanding this. And Rashi in his commentary presents both of the understandings. Understanding number one is that uh, God appeared there in the form of three men. That, that, that God sent three, what it means here is that God sent three angels uh, to, uh, as we find out in the continuation, these men weren't uh, regular kind of men, they were angels. And so- You're gonna take so, those three it, pieces of pizza. So the, uh, so, so that's one way of understanding what's happening here. The second way of understanding it also appears in Rashi, that God appeared to him, and then three men appeared to him, and that Avraham said to, uh, that, that Avraham said uh, to God, who had appeared to him in verse one, that he said to him, Adonai, instead of translating my lords, he's referring to, he's talking directly to God who appeared in verse one and saying to him, uh, if, please stay. I have to take care of these three guys who showed up here. And so could you just wait a little bit is what he says in verse three. And then in verse four, he turns to the three men and he says to them, what? you Okay. Um, I'm, uh, could could people mute themselves if they uh, if they have background uh, noises? I uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, so these those are the two models. Is it uh, God appearing by sending three angels, or does God appear and then three people uh, and then three people appear? So those are the two models. But as we go through the text, we find that it gets more complicated. So Avram is standing there interacting with these three angels. And then Sarah laughs in verse 12. Sarah laughed to herself saying, now that I am withered, I might have enjoyment with my husband so old. Am I going to have a baby uh -huh. now? And then yud hey vav hey said to Avraham. it says in the Hebrew text, yud hey vav hey said to Avraham. why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I in truth bear a child old as I am? So now we see that it really seems like yud hey vav hey has been there that whole time. Uh, because we, we, we had the, uh, the angels, the men speaking, and now suddenly yud hey vav hey is speaking. And yud hey vav hey says, is anything too wondrous for yod heh vav -Hey? I will return to you at the same season next year, and Sarah will have a son. Okay, so that's the uh, part of the problem of this text. Then the text goes on. You know, Abraham is still there with these three people, and then it says in verse 20 there in chapter 18, by Yomer yod heh vav -Hey. Then yod heh vav -Hey said, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grave. So again, it seems like yod heh vav -Hey is there. It doesn't say that, they, that that's what the men said to him. Uh, you know, the, the, the men spoke before that. They said, uh, they said to him things like, Kain ta sek asher di barta. yes, uh, do what you said. But now yod heh vav -Hey is speaking and is saying that, uh, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great. And verse 22 says, the men went from there to Sodom while Abraham remained standing before yod heh vav -Hey. And Abraham uh, said to yod heh vav -Hey, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? So, you know, it, it, it's really hard to interpret it, interpret the text in the way that God appeared in the form of three people. Because now God is being uh, Yudhe Bave is is appearing here as a as a character here. And then we get to chapter nineteen when uh, when uh, Saddam is about to get uh, destroyed, and it says the Yudhe Bave him tir al Saddam va la morag go frit va esh me eight Yudhe Bave. Min Hashamayim. Yud Hey Vav -Hey rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfurous fire from Yud Hey Vav -Hey from heaven. 
And so we have that the, we have the uh, syntactical difficulty here of yud heh vav appearing twice in this verse, which we saw in one of the earlier sessions of this course. And it, it was a, a Christian argument uh, to prove the Trinity Tertullian in the second and third century, that he wasn't the only early Christian who said this, a much more ancient testimony of Jesus' divinity we have also found in Genesis. Then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Wait a second, there's the Lord raining down from the Lord. So there are two there. There's the, the, the Father and the Son. That's what uh, Tertullian is saying. Now, Tertullian says, either deny that this is scripture or else let me ask, what sort of man are you that you do not think words ought to be taken and understood in the sense in which they are written, especially when they aren't expressed in allegories and parables, but in determinate and simple declarations? Doesn't this make it clear that there's, you know, there's a, a yud heh vav -he here on earth and there's a yud heh vav -he there in uh, in heaven. So that, that this was the common Christian reading of this text. In a previous session, we saw the way the Talmudic rabbis dealt with this difficulty of this verse. yud heh vav -Heh rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur, fire from yud heh vav -Heh from heaven. The verse should read from him. That's what a certain mean Probably a Christian said to Rabbi Ishmael ben Rabbi Yossi in the late second century, doesn't this prove something here? Don't you see two yud heh vav -Hey's here in this uh, verse? To which uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ishmael, uh, uh, a, a, a certain low level person who was there in Rabbi Ishmael's entourage decided that he could answer this. He says to Rabbi Ishmael, let me answer him. He said to the mean, it is written, Lemech said to his wives, Adan Sila, hear my voice. All wives of Lemech give ear to my speech. The verse should have said my wives, but that's how biblical verses work. So also in the case of the verse about Sodom, that's how biblical verses were, work. In other words, sometimes people refer to themselves in third person. Lemech speaking here says, he's talking to his wives, and he doesn't say to them, oh, wives of mine. He says, oh, Bring wives him back of into Lemech, my room. even though he is the one who is speaking. Uh, so there is no difficulty there. I can't there get into the bathroom to, to get her. Con I can't get into the condition. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can uh, mute everyone, but I'm having some uh, difficulty uh, figuring that out. Uh, okay, mute all. I muted. Okay. I muted them. I I got this. I just heard that. I muted them. Thank you very much. Very good. And I hope I'm not muted. Can no, you hear you're me? not. No, you're not. Very you're back good. as host. You're back as host. I'm back as host. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we had a traditional Jewish answer to try to deal with this Christian claim. The Christian claim that goes back to Talmudic times uh, is, uh, is that th there's a kind of duality of yud heh vav -Heh being presented here, a duality of God. And the, the standard Talmudic answer is, well, people sometimes talk about themselves in third person and just get over it. That's a common biblical style. What does Rashbam do in his commentary on Genesis 18 and 19? He does something that no Jewish commentator before him ever did. Just read through the snippets of his commentary here. Yud heh vav -Heh appeared to him. In what manner? Three men who were angels came to him. Okay, that, that's not so unusual. Rashi mentioned an interpretation like that uh, also. But then in verse 13, when Yud heh vav -Heh says, why did uh, Sarah laugh? Rashbam, the first person in Jewish history says that Yud heh vav -Heh is actually the name of the chief angel. When it says, Vayomer Yud Hei Vav Hei Hamalach, Gadol Shebahim. And then when this Yud Hei Vav Hei says this, and then Yud Hei Vav Hei goes on and says, is anything too wondrous for Yud Hei Vav Hei, i.e. for the one who sent us to you. 
And similarly, the verse, yud hey vav hey rain down on Sodom, uh, sulfurous fire from yud hey vav hey out of heaven. The first yud hey vav hey refers to the angel Gabriel, and the second refers to God. So this is a surprising thing to find Rashbam saying that yud hey vav hey can be the name of an angel. And this, this changes really the understanding of Genesis 18 and 19 in a very uh, different way. That The men set out from there, I'm continuing to read Rashbam's commentary here, verse 16 in chapter 18, the men sent out from there, two of them went to Sodom, as it is written, the two angels arrived in Sodom, while the chief angel remained speaking with Abraham, about this chief angel, it is written, now yud hey vav hey, in other words, the chief angel had said, shall I hide? And Abraham remained standing before yud hey vav hey, in other words, before the chief angel. Both these verses refer to the third angel. Why are there only two angels who show up in Sodom? Because one of the angels stays back there talking to Abraham, and that's the one whose name is yud hey vav hey. And when Abraham is arguing with yud hey vav hey about what will be the, uh, the, the fate of Sodom. Actually, he's arguing, according to Rashbam, with the chief angel. Uh, verse 20 here, Vayomer yud hey vav hey, the angel said to Abraham, I am sending these messengers. This is what the, the chief is saying. I'm sending the other two to Sodom because of the outrage of Sodom. And then when Abraham is arguing with this person and he turns to, uh, to whoever he's arguing with and he says, kol lo mishpat, will the judge of the entire earth not do, uh, not, not do what is just? What he was saying, he's talking to the angel and he's saying to the angel, doesn't God deal with justice? So, you know, it changes, in many ways, it changes how radical it is that Rashbam, uh, that Avraham is arguing with God. He isn't arguing with God, he's actually arguing with the chief angel. And Rashbam continues to say this, that yud hey vav hey, throughout much of the story is the chief angel. Clearly, I want to make this very clear. It's not that he's offering an interpretation that the Christians offered to this text, but Jews for Jews attempted to stay away from interpretations of this nature, where uh, where yud hey vav, where there could be like this kind of confusion about yud hey vav hey. That is yud hey vav hey referring to God, or is it referring to an angel, or is it referring to a person. You know, these the people are uh, the, the angels are described as anashim, and he says that like the head of these anashim is yud hey vav hey. Uh, I think. That Rashbam, who I have reason to think uh, had conversations with Christians about the meaning of the Bible, is giving a kind of Judaized understanding that goes along with the basic premise of the uh, of the Christian interpretation here that there are two Yud Hey Vav Hey's involved in this. Story. There's the Yud Hey Vav Hey in heaven, and there's the Yud Hey Vav Hey who is down here on earth. And of course, Rashbam doesn't think that the Yud Hey Vav Hey down here on earth is uh, is the Son of God, but he thinks that it's the head of the head angel who is called Yud Hey Vav Hey. So I would like to think I can't prove it, but I would like to think that it is possible that Rashbam's interpretation of biblical texts. Uh, was to a small extent influenced by the conversations that he had with Christians. And I would like to think that to a large extent, the Christians who, with whom Rashbam had conversations were influenced by what Rashbam said. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at the chat now. Uh, okay. Is there a difference between Emmanuel with an E or Emmanuel with an I? I'm, uh, I, 
I'm not sure. Uh, my daughter and I had long uh, conversations about that when uh, she decided to name her uh, child Emmanuel. I don't really think that there is a uh, a, a, a difference. Uh, of course, by the time of Rav Haigalon, the Christians aren't running the show in Babylonia. Very true. Possibly helpful that both of them are demi. That's there's a difference between the, the very good point, Ella, that consulting with the Christians, when you're in a country that is a Christian country, is very different from consulting with the Christians in a country where the Christians and the Jews are both minorities. And what did the Catholicos answer? You know, I never actually read the entire introduction of Rav Yosef Ibn Aknin to his uh, to his commentary on Shir Hashirim. I only read the section that uh, Professor Talmadge uh, put into his article, and Professor Talmadge did not share that. So somebody will have to uh, uh, do some more research to be able to answer uh, Gerald's uh, question. Uh, yes. Maybe then, like now, not all things should be committed to writing or email, tweet, text, uh, though not impossible to get in trouble. Yes. And many people asking people to mute. Thank you very much for trying. Uh, how does this rush bomb on Habaya in Bayera relate to his commentary written in Atbash in Shmont? I don't think it's related, but he does have an unusual commentary. You're right about what the meaning of yud hey vav hey is, but, but the... It, it was very common among Jewish interpreters to say that the word Elohim is something is a word that could be used uh, not just for God, but could be used for angels and could even be used for judges. But that Yud Hey Vav Hey was something that was restricted to God, and uh, and Rashbam suggests that that uh, Rashbam does not go along with that. Emmanuel with an I and Emmanuel with an E probably depends more on the local language. I agree, that's probably true. Uh, viewed as emissaries of God speaking on behalf or for God, ergo using yud hey vav gives gravitas to their angels' words. Some people have tried to argue that that's all that Rushbaum is saying. A scholar here in Israel who I sometimes agree with and sometimes do not, a fine uh, fine man named, uh, named Yonatan Yaakovs at Bar Ilan University uh, claims that I'm overreading this uh, this text of Rashbam and that's all he's saying is that he's not really saying that that's the name that I, I, I think that we're, he keeps going through there and saying Yud Hei Vav Hei Amalach Gadol Shabahim he keeps keeps repeating this it's it's more than just saying that uh uh, more than just saying that this Malach is speaking in the name of, uh, of God. Uh, yes, uh, whoever iPad is, Professor James Kugel has a different take on encountering angels. Yes, uh, he definitely does. That's true. The name of the researcher of, on, of Andrew of St. Victor is Monse, spelled M-O-N-T-S-E. Leira. Is her Leira Kuria is her last name. Two words: L E Y R A C U R I A. Uh, and she, uh, after spending ten years uh, here in Israel uh, studying, she's uh, back in Spain, where she came from, and uh, teaching in in a university in uh, in Spain. Uh, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask uh, another fast uh, question, uh, go right ahead. Um, um, can I make a suggestion? Sure. Perhaps Rashbam holds that only Moshe spoke to Hashem face to face, mm -hmm. and other conversations with the Ribbono Shalom are via some sort of messenger, whatever exactly that means. He's actually speaking to God, but it's not face to face. Right. Good. Okay. It's not. Uh, uh, I think that's a reasonable interpretation. I'm not sure that that's what Rashbam is saying, but I think that that is a, uh, a reasonable interpretation. Um, is 
Rabbi Adler here. If you are Rabbi Adler, if you could uh, unmute yourself. Um, Okay. Dr. Rabbi Larson, Kelman, are you there? Oh, oh you're yeah, still there. I'm just here. I'm actually starting to teach exactly at, at 12 when you have your meeting. Don't don't worry, we'll deal with Rabbi. It just thank you very much. It's okay. fine. Okay. Okay. Yes. We'll we'll yes. we'll deal with it. And uh, as Rabbi Election is alluding to, Rabbi Abner, our and Abner today will be giving a shear, second shear on re-experiencing the Rav's, you know, Pesach, a fascinating shear last week, this week talking on the four, the four sons, the four children, whatever. So that's going to be at one o'clock. And then at 2.15, Lori Novak is going to give a woman in the Seder. So hope we you can make it, take a, an hour for lunch, and then come back <laughs> for some more learning or, or supper if you're in Israel. So wherever you happen to be, or breakfast in California. Okay, anyways, everybody have a wonderful day. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much.